the Thoughty or Tea podcast. And what, what would those sort of red flags be for you? It, it's difficult because alexithymia, alexithymia, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. My favourite topic. Everyone knows I mention it every 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 episode that I can. <laughs> you, you need to get yourself a bingo card for, for listeners. Yeah, yeah. Put like a little counter in there. How many times has Thomas mentioned alexithymia? <laughs> alexithymia, there you go. So alexithymia, with, with my difficulty in identifying and describing my feelings, I've got a little emotions wheel on my phone. It's helpful, but it's not going to do the trick, right? So I've had to adapt everything to fit that. And so yeah. I, I have red flags for burnout, which are my behavior or my, or my social behavior, or my energy. And those are much easier to, to recognize than feelings. You get feedback, don't you? Mm, exactly. So the, the small behavior changes include things like not singing, eating less, neglecting chores before because they just don't seem worth it. Or a big mm. one for me are ticks. They're very hard yes. to, to ignore. My my neck just goes back, you know? I get I get little ones. It's mostly from like the, the sides. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I get them with my arms, but oh. I they, Mm-hmm. I hardly have any when I'm not anxious, but if I start getting anxious, then I get little ones. Um, if I have like a meltdown or something, they get like really intense. Yes, same for me. And I used to really struggle with tics. I used to also have a speech impediment. I absolutely hated it, but I've grown to love them because they're there to help me. They're there to protect me. They're there. They're literally my body telling me, babes, slow down, please. We're yeah. overstimulated. So, you know, we, we work together. Yeah. Mm, socially, I really become obsessed with any errors I might have made. I reread emails and messages a lot anyway. I've trying been trying to get a handle on them, but it can escalate to like rereading an email to a colleague 30 times. I withdraw and isolate myself. I lose my words. And interestingly, this is something that a friend of mine mentioned that, that, that she experiences, and I definitely do the same. I help people more. When I'm going into that crisis mode of, okay, there's a lot of problems going on here, I start helping others rather than stopping to, and helping myself first, which mm. is interesting. So you like switching your focus onto someone else because that's like... It's uh, I, you know what I actually I I relate to that. Mm-hmm. The worse that I'm doing, the more likely I am to like offer up my energy and my time for people who are struggling too. I don't know yeah. if that's just. I think that might be just a, a, a the empathy aspect of it, because you kind of you feel it a lot more because it's something that you're you're experiencing. Not not perhaps for the same reason or at the same level, but you are experiencing something similar so you're like oh man i really feel this and you just want to take mm-hmm. care of people make sure they're all right <laughs> maybe i don't know why it is but it's definitely a thing and it's odd especially because i know that the general feelings that accompany my the, the, the road to burnout for me are mm. sort of forgetting what makes me happy and feeling yeah. meaningless or just being overwhelmed more easily and getting more meltdowns and I, and I know that if I ignore all the behaviours that I mentioned earlier and these general feelings, it can all escalate into physical illness. I will once again get that psychosomatic illness of the weird cough that comes from nowhere that I mentioned that I had a lot as a child. But I get cold sores on my lips and on my fingers sometimes as well, which is generally just being more... Signs of low, low immune system because mm. it does anxiety and cortisol and things like that they do affect your your body yeah. in a lot of different ways definitely and so these are those are my red flags i have a list and i try and keep it fairly updated and then whenever a few of those flags are raised at the same time that's when i know okay it's time to to go and do something about this and have a little meeting with myself and figure out where do we go from here it's really helpful because it's a good quantifier of okay don't worry about it don't worry 
if you're going into burnout until you've reached this this mm. point. I'd like to mention a resource which is super helpful before you go out and make a list of burnout indicators. It's called Know Your Normal. It's a resource we made with Ambitious About Autism. You can find it on their website. And it's a great way for you to figure out what your baseline is of when do I usually go to bed? How many hours do I sleep? Who are the people I hang out with? What are my mm. favorite interests, my favorite foods? Everything that's your normal life. It's a very accessible resource and really fun to fill in because that way you've then got a resource that you can utilize your natural strength and pattern recognition and figure out when you've deviated from your normal yeah. and spot yeah. when things are going wrong so much easier. I think um, a good red flag for me in terms of burnout is a lot to do with transition times. Um, you know, so for, for a lot of autistic people, it can take us a bit longer to switch. It's it's kind of, it's been a bit, it's a, a bit funny, like, um, talking to some parents about it, because it's like, they, they feel like it's something that would only be an issue when you're going in to do something that you don't want to do. Like uh, these these transition times, like it's, for example, it's it's not necessarily I need a long transition time to go from rest to work. It's the opposite way as well. It's like it takes me a while to get out of work mode and get into rest mode. But but in terms of burnout, I mean, for me, it's it's the case that um, I'll have periods of time where I just completely ignore all transition times throughout the day so i just won't give myself any any rest or breathing time in between things it could be like as little a little as going down and getting a glass of water um you know that that tends to become a lot harder for me to do to like break things up in that way and um not just jump from task to task like it happens when i'm approaching a burnout yes. um and then i also have the opposite side where my transition times sometimes just take forever, for for ages. You know, I finish the day at work and I really want to go to the gym, but for some reason I've been sat on my bed for two hours. Um, just you know, I want to move, I just can't. I'm just kind of yeah. locked, locked into um, the environment that I'm in, and not not able to kind of transition, um, both from from rest to work, but also from, um work to rest to sleep you know so all of those things that kind of compiling over each other and because i'm setting myself such a high workload during that time because i'm approaching a burnout um i get behind on stuff and then it kind of builds up and the transition times get longer and longer and then you know i just find myself unable to cope with things and mm. i also give myself more to do when i feel like i'm approaching that burnout i don't think it's because I want to feel busy and distract myself I genuinely just think it's because in that moment where you feel like you're drowning all the small issues feel insurmountable and so everything has this sense of urgency because everything is equally bad everything is equally mm. hard everything is equally terrifying and that's because it's all 100% awful yeah just reaching the, the top of your limits mm. Whereas usually you'd have, not when, when you're not drowning, you'd have much calmer processing. You'd have all the executive function skills that you need and you'd be able to assess, okay, this task is low Prioritization. priority. Mm. This task has high priority, but I'm going to find it difficult, so I'm going to ask a friend for help. This task is important for my well-being, so I'm going to do it now. That sort of thing. But because we're drowning, you're just clutching at all the straws, trying to do everything at once. And clearly that's going to make things worse, which is interesting. Uh, the same friend who mentioned the um, cupcake. I'm going to start that sentence again. It, it, <laughs> a friend of mine pointed out that when she's going into burnout, she also feels the same way around everything being really urgent and trying to do all the things. And it's sort of because she finds it easier to just get into the burnout and recover from there rather than stop. And that surprised me because 
well, we've not really talked about it before. I think this whole burnout, it's it's a massive mental health topic, but still not really talked about. And so, especially if we don't have those mechanisms for de-escalation, that Mm. how we don't have that empathy for ourselves and we don't stop and just reduce pressure on ourselves, then it's going to be really tempting to just push yourself into burnout because then you're physically incapable of doing more. And so it feels like less effort to recover when actually what we need to do when we're feeling like we're drowning, we just need to take a deep breath, hold it and float up to the surface and pause. Yeah. But same like a drowning person, they're going to be thrashing their arms around when actually what they need to do is just put their arms underwater and just breathe. But that takes practice and is terrifying because it doesn't feel like like it's the right, the right thing, to, thing do. to do. Yeah, I think that that's really important that you mention that because you know the me- the the mechanism behind cortisol and adrenaline is that it's used to give you energy and to drive you forward to problem solve and to get out of a stressful situation. And as I said, like might be good in a very simple situation where your life's in danger. Sounds sounds a bit weird me saying that, but in it chronically in, in such a complex world that we live in, it, it doesn't doesn't do us any favors because it does kind of feel like I, I really empathize with what you were saying about your friend because it's the same for me. It's like once that adrenaline courses all builds up um around something like perhaps you're trying to edit something. And you finished it and you've got a deadline in a bit, but the program isn't working. And so you start opening up loads of different other programs to try and figure out why the program's not working. And you restart it. And so you you halt the program being able to, <laughs> to work. And you just get, keep restarting it and you keep trying to do stuff. But really what you need to do is probably just leave it for a bit and come back later, even mm-hmm. though you want to do it. Um but I think it very much when you're in the midst of that, those cortisol and adrenaline spikes, everything in your mind and your body is telling you to work on it and to try and get it sorted so that you can relax. Mm-hmm. When, as you said, sometimes it's a lot of the time when you're in those situations, it's good to step back because although it gives you more energy and it makes you more focused, it also impedes, like, impacts your cognitive function. Mm. your ability to think clearly and think over stuff slowly and problem solve like is needed for those complex tasks yeah stepping back taking a breath can feel really illogical so there's no shame in it whatsoever that that people continue doing it and there's no shame in burnout full stop really Mm. it takes me about an hour two hours sometimes like stepping back from something that first hour is always the hardest because I feel like everything could be solved by me completing this task. Brute force. Um, brute forcing it. it. Brute force yeah. problem solving. Yes, it feels great. Exhausting. Yeah. And not always the best option. No. Oh dear. 